Good afternoon and good morning to those who are in Europe. Welcome to the second day of European Research Days Japan 2022. My name is Tatsuya Maisawa and I'm the country representative at EuroAccess Japan and it is my pleasure to moderate today's event. First of all, thank you very much for coming to the venue here at the German Cultural Center in Tokyo, and thank you for tuning in the live stream channel on YouTube. It's been quite a while since we had a physical event last time. We are very happy to have you all here. Also, I would like to extend my thanks to German Academic Exchange Service, the ARD Regional Office Tokyo, which is the co-host of today's event and um, has generously provided the venue for the whole events. And the German Embassy in Japan for providing financial support for live streaming. Also, Director of the ARD Tokyo, uh, Mr. Axel Korpenstein accepted willingly to join the event as a guest speaker today. European Research Days Japan 2022 is the annual flagship uh, event of EuroAccess Japan and its partners. This three-day event is designed as a platform for researchers, innovators, uh, practitioners and professionals across Japan to follow research, uh, research achievements and the career paths for the European researchers who are studying and working in Japan and to explore collaboration and career development opportunities with European partners. Following from yesterday's day one webinar, we have invited distinguished speakers from research institutions, European research organizations, and the European embassies and cultural institutes in Japan to share exciting information with you. And tomorrow, we will feature research and science from different perspectives, such as how to become effective science communicators and how to change a career path from academia to industry, or vice versa, to realize one's potential. So please stay with us and pick up the information that suits you best. The, uh, I also would like to extend uh, our sincere thanks to the German Center for Research and Innovation Tokyo, German JSPS Alumni Association, Scienscope, the French Students and Researchers Organizations in Japan, the Association of Spanish Researchers in Japan, uh, is Japan, the Association of Italian Researchers in Japan, for your generous support to make this event possible. Now let's turn the time over to our distinguished guests. Unfortunately, today's uh, speaker for the... Oh, <laughs> it's nice to have you here. Okay, so now let's turn to the time over to our distinguished guests. It's my great honor to introduce you to the EU ambassador to Japan, His Excellency Generic Paquet, who will deliver his keynote speech to open today's event. Ambassador Paquet, floor is yours. Good afternoon. Well, it's a real pleasure to say a few words uh, at the opening of um, today's uh, session of the European Research Days in Japan. As um, some of you in the audience may know, um, I was Director General for Research and Innovation in the European Commission until the 1st of September, seven weeks ago. And in that capacity, I had the privilege of uh, opening and speaking at many EURACCESS events around the world. This is um, for the European Union a particularly important um, uh, group of uh, colleagues and friends. You are scientists um, uh, which are either working in Europe, coming from abroad, or you are European scientists abroad. 
And in research and innovation, there is little doubt to be had that we need to promote the mobility of uh, scientists, young scientists, to ensure that um, we can cooperate globally on our research uh, challenges. So I would like also to, to warmly thank um, the different um, uh, teams which are organizing uh, today's event and which are indeed uh, active here in Tokyo and in Japan more generally to build bridges between the Japanese uh, research and innovation system and Europe's and member states' um, uh, research and innovation system. So the German Academic Exchange uh, Service, the German Center for Research and Innovation in Tokyo, the German JSPS Alumni Association, Science Scope, Science Scope, the French Student and Researchers Organization in Japan, the Association of Spanish Researchers in Japan, and the Association of Italian Researchers in Japan. And of course, I'm also particularly happy to be here with um, uh, my fellow ambassador, Norbert Palanovic, who will speak about opportunities in Hungary in a short moment. Uh, cooperating in, in science and innovation for Europe and Japan is absolutely critical. We are confronted um, with the same challenges, uh, certainly challenges linked to the uh, very difficult geopolitical situation, the war in Ukraine, the brutal Russian aggression on Ukraine is uh, shifting uh, the world order. The way Russia is putting into question the UN system is of course a, a particular source of concern and it, and it impacts also uh, on, on scientists. It certainly also means that um, uh, Europe and Japan want to work more closely than ever. We are looking at the world with the same values um, and the same uh, purpose, and we are confronted with the same challenges. The war in Ukraine creates a massive uh, energy crisis. Uh, the way uh, Russia is, um, has limited the export of uh, food and fertilizers out of Ukraine has also created a, a food crisis, uh, hopefully um, improving. We, of course, are confronted um, uh, on a more long-term basis with the challenge of biodiversity loss, ever increasing, and obviously uh, climate change. And speaking to scientists, uh, I don't need to tell you uh, that science is uh, clearer than ever. Uh, we are running and probably have in large part run out of time in promoting the deep changes which will be technological but also societal which will be needed worldwide to ensure that we stay within the boundaries of the Paris Agreement and 1.5 degrees of warming is already producing, we are at 1.1 degree today, producing massive shifts in weathers and uh, and weather events um, and other uh, droughts and fires uh, and natural catastrophes at 1.5 degrees this will be very much more significant and the risk of overshooting up to two degrees maybe more it cannot be excluded today this is where science comes in to inform but also to provide uh, solutions uh, to uh, these challenges solutions in terms of uh, uh, energy, in terms of transport, in terms of agriculture, and also uh, solutions which need to cut across these policy areas in a much more systemic way. This is a challenge in Japan, this is one in Europe, and I think we are having experiences which uh, overlap in part, but which are different as well, and there is so much which uh, Japanese science can do with European science and vice versa. So I can only encourage uh, scientists on both sides to look at uh, the other and seek experience and exposure uh, to another science uh, system, to another science and innovation environment, another science culture. I'm saying this because I have the firm belief from my years of director general that um, the re one of the reasons why Europe is the best place in the world to do science, maybe just to note that I think we, we, we got three, four, four Nobel Prizes prizes in science this year, one in medicine, uh, a, no, a Swedish a colleague of Estonian origin, uh, one um, in chemistry and two in physics with quantum computers. So the best science is certainly happening in Europe, not least because we are funding it very well with the European Research Council, but also 
because we have 27 science cultures and within these 27 science cultures researchers move very largely with Marie Skodowska Curie schemes with uh, the Euro European Horizon programs and that creates of course uh, an amazing uh, uh, mingling of ideas, approaches and solutions allowing science to really perform at its highest level and interact with society. This is why what I think we need to do between Europe and Japan and this is why the European Union and Japan are today discussing on how to bring this cooperation further, better use the existing platforms like the European Research Council visiting schemes where Japanese researchers can join ERC teams um, uh, for, for several months like Marie Skodowska Curie, allowing many scientists to move uh, to Japan or to Europe to build on that, but go beyond uh, with um, associating uh, Japan uh, to Horizon Europe, making Japan a full member of Horizon Europe, um, allowing Japan to be in Horizon Europe like France, Hungary, Estonia, Romania or Germany. Uh, this, of course, would be uh, an absolute game changer. This would allow Japanese teams to be seamlessly embedded in European consortia, carrying out this groundbreaking research, and would, of course, um, very significantly enrich uh, the research carried out in these uh, European consortia. The discussions are still ongoing, um, and I very much hope that in the coming weeks and months we will see progress so that this uh, association of Japan can be decided, it's not yet decided, uh, and confirmed and rolled out, allowing uh, with that uh, research teams uh, on both sides to really join up and provide the solutions which our societies so much need from you. Well, this was maybe a little bit broader than the Euro Access Conference, but I wanted to, to pass that message. And you can count on EU ambassadors, all 28 of us, uh, to help you in finding uh, your place in Europe and you can count on all of us also to help European scientists come over here to Japan, Tokyo and in the very many other places which are doing great research in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much Ambassador Paquet for your excellent remarks. Uh, there was uh, very encouraging uh, words for the scientists and also he reminds us of growing needs more uh, for the strong ties between Japan and EU. Now, uh, let us begin with the panel one, which have a very exciting lineup for the presentations on the both funding opportunities in Europe and research achievements by European researchers in Japan. Before we invite the fi uh, first speaker, I would like to remind you that we will have a Q&A session after all the presentations. For those who are watching live stream channel, you can post your questions on the Slido during the presentations. The link is displayed in the description box under the screen. We'll bring them up during the Q&A session. So let me invite first distinguished guest speaker, His Excellency Dr. Norbert Palanovic, Ambassador of Hungary to Japan, to talk about research funding Hungary. Ambassador Palanovic, please proceed to the podium and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning in Europe and good afternoon in Japan. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, uh, to be able to participate in European Research Day and also to be able to introduce the achievements of Hungarian scholars and scientists in science and research and of course the opportunities for cooperation in this field. Well, even more importantly, I'm very grateful to your access, Japan and the German Ex Academic Exchange Service. Uh, they are the original office, Tokyo, and the German Center for Research and Innovation, Tokyo, to host this event. Um, of course, 
funding or collaboration opportunities makes no sense or have no use if there is no demand for it. So that's why I would like to highlight a few of the practical activities of our embassy in this, in this field. So how we contribute to raise interest in Japan for the cooperation with Hungarian scholars, academic institutions, or other bilateral or multilateral uh, platforms, such as the Visegrad uh, group, as well as their funding opportunities. Um, as an ambassador, one of my regular duties is to highlight the success stories of Hungarian science and scientists and to showcase who or what represents Hungarian science the best. Well, the answer is these days, fortunately or unfortunately, quite obvious in these pandemic times. And my answer to this would be Professor Kariko Katalin, uh, the mother of the mRNA vaccine. So with the help of her invention of the mRNA vaccine, which was developed uh, uh, by a European uh, um, uh, company, with the help of uh, Professor Kariko, who received actually the prestigious Japan Prize this year and the KO Medical Prize uh, last year, millions and millions were able to overcome the pandemic and slowly come back to, to, to normal life. But nevertheless, actually, if there was only one more thing to mention about the Hungarian quality of science or innovation, I would highlight uh, the Rubik's Cube. I have one in my office, and usually I carry one with, with me. Unfortunately, I don't have it here uh, with me on stage. But uh, the Rubik's Cube, you know, which was originally developed by a Hungarian architect as an educational tool, um, Mr. Erne Rubik uh, developed it. Uh, to educate uh, uh, future architects. It would well represent the creativity, the innovation, and the talent of the Hungarians that have determined our past, present, and hopefully will determine our future. Well, this is well described in a recent book that was uh, written by Mr. Rubik and that was published two years ago in English, uh, titled Cubed, The Puzzle of Us All. And then this book was published in Japanese uh, this year, and this is called Shikaku Rokumen, Kyubito Watashi. And actually, this book was selected this summer uh, as a recommended reading for students by the Japan School Library Association. We are also aware that in order to have future karikos or future rubiks, we need support and we need funding. And then it, needed to be, it is needed to be provided now in order to nurture the top researchers of the future. So in this slide, Hungary is making efforts to introduce our Stipendium Hungaricum or Stipendium Hungaricum program, which offers a wide range of courses for international students. Currently, 600 full degree uh, programs, degree and non-degree programs are in the scheme, uh, covering all fields and all levels of higher education, including part-time and full-time doctoral, doctoral programs for the junior researchers as well. We are providing the Stipendium Hungaricum to 100 Japanese students, actually, and then this program started in 2013 here. So next year we are entering the 10th anniversary uh, of the collaboration with Japan. And we are very proud that at this moment we have 600 Japanese students uh, studying in Hungary, mainly in the fields of medicine and music. And as Hungary has 150 university research groups and several excellent academic research institutes, it may not be difficult to pursue a research career in Hungary when engaged in university studies, participate in university-owned research institutions, or collaborate with external independent research institutions. We have the National Research Development and Innovation Office, which is the most influential funding agency in Hungary. Established, uh, and this established a support system for the individual researchers, and it covers the entire research career from the high school all the way to senior researchers. And of course, these funding programs are open for international researchers as well. Well, the bilateral scientific and technology collaborations with mobility support is also encouraged by the National Research Development and Innovation Office, and Hungary has several scientific bilateral programs, and one of them is with Japan. The next bilateral scientific meeting with Japan is scheduled to take place in Hungary next year in 2023, and where the new scientific directions and topics will be decided for the next call. But moreover, the Japan Science and Technology Society and the Hungarian Academy of Sciences have a Japan-Hungary research cooperative program in humanities, social, and natural sciences. On the multilateral level, the Visegrad Group countries, or the V4 countries of Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, and Hungary, run a joint project called the Visegrad Group Japan Joint Research Program. Under the research team of advanced materials, five consortia are currently working on their research projects for a period of three years. In the previous call, we had a Nobel laureate, Professor Amano Hiroshi from the Nagoya University, among the participants. 
and as a researcher. And when it comes to Japanese-Hungarian research cooperation, one of the most interesting and promising research topics in Japan is the research about myography, a topic that you will hear uh, very soon about. And it will be presented by Professor Laszlo Ola, who will talk about his research experience and collaboration with local scientists, researchers, and scholars. Well, he's much more authentic to talk about this topic than I am. So I should stop here and let him introduce the fantastic world of muon and myography. But more than that, uh, the latest research, research achievements between Hungary and Japan and the fruitful collaboration that uh, this uh, uh, cooperation led to. Thank you very much. And I wish you a fruitful day today and on the forthcoming days as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Panovic, for a very informative speech about opportunities in Hungary. And I think this is a very an, an eye-opener for those who are interested in studying abroad. For the next presentation, as Ambassador Panovic uh, mentioned, we have invited Dr. Laszlo Ola, project researcher at Earthquake Research Institute, the University of Tokyo. The title his presentation is Cosmic Ray Muon Imaging of Large Structures in EU-Japan Collaboration. Dr. Ola, please uh, proceed with your presentation when you are ready. Uh, thank you very much for these nice introductions. So my name is Laszlo Ola. I am a researcher at the University of Tokyo, and I would like to present to you an example for uh, cooperation between EU and Japan partners. So the topic will be cosmic ray muon imaging. This is the outline of my talk. First of all, I would like to present to you the principles of muon imaging, and I will discuss the works that led to the Japan-Hungary collaboration. In the second part of my presentation, I will talk about a project which is focusing on one of Japan's most active volcanoes, the Sakurajamu volcano. In the third part, I will talk about uh, intersectoral collaborations between academy and industry, which aims to lead more benefits to our society. At the end, I will summarize and, uh, and discuss briefly the future perspectives. So cosmic ray muon imaging. What are cosmic muons? Cosmic muons are the gift of the nature these are elementary particles, similar to electrons, which are the building blocks of our world. But these particles have similar physical properties, but their mass is 200 times larger. So we call them, let's say, the big brother of electrons. So this, <coughs> as you can see in the lower left image, these particles continuously produced in our atmosphere. So this is a natural background radiation, and thanks to its physical properties, these particles can reach down to the surface everywhere. They have a finite uh, yield. For example, these particles penetrate through your body about 100 in every second. And how, how do we use these particles for imaging? I assume we are in the Goethe Institute, so I would like to highlight uh, a nice development by a German physicist, Röntgen, who, who developed the X-ray imaging in Würzburg. 1895, on the middle, you can see an X-ray image of uh, his wife, which captured in 19, uh, 1895. So the principle is similar in case of myography. Uh, we have a target, which is typically large size, like a mountain or a volcano and we put a detector in front of this object, and we are tracking the cosmic ray muons which are penetrating through this object. And based on the numbers that we are detecting, we can reconstruct the amount of materials. Like in the X-ray image, you can see that where there are more materials, the image is more darker. When there is no, just only air, you can see it's quiet light. So it, it can be similar in case of large-scale objects. You can see on the right some examples uh, of four volcanoes which were captured by muons, by Japanese scientists. So, so the difference between the amount of material can be visualized by the cosmic ray particles. So the methodology ha has already been developed in the middle of 20th century 
but uh, the technological development did not allow to produce such an images at that time. So us, the detector technology development progressed during the 20th century. In the middle of, at the beginning of the 21st century, they could produce the first images that provided useful information. For example, in case of volcanoes, if uh, you see the increase of the amount of material underneath the active crater, it may suggest that the volcano will erupt. So it's quite useful for the experts of these fields. Just a few words about uh, what kind of work led to a Japanese-Hungarian collaboration. So I was a student from 29 to 2017. I did my bachelor, master, and PhD degree at Wigner Research Center for Physics. And my, my work focused on research and development of particle physics instrumentation for cosmic muon tracking and also from high energy physics experiment in, uh, in Geneva. And we succeed with the development of uh, portable instruments which are lightweight, uh, small size, and they can carry out, uh, they can be carried out of the laboratory into places which are difficult to assess, like uh, natural caves, as you can see in the lower left image. So we could conduct uh, surveys for searching uh, underground cavities. We could use it for an inspection of underground tunnels. Also, we had uh, collaborations with some German partners in Dresden. We used our technique to measure the background for astrophysical experiments. Also, we had some cooperations with uh, our partners in University of Novi Sad, Serbia, where we aimed to detect uh, simultaneously the muons, which are penetrating through low-density materials and uh, particles, secondary particles, which created by the muon in the materials. And these allowed to, to measure the, the, the low-density materials, like soft tissues, bones, so, so some developments are still go ongoing in this direction. But later, uh, in the middle of 2010s, we turned to volcano imaging. Uh, we initiated a collaboration with the University of uh, Tokyo, and we, we had, of course, support from the Embassy of Hungary in, in, in Tokyo to formalize this cooperation. And of course, the Japanese uh, partners uh, developed the volcano observation instruments earlier. But the Hungarian innovation, this lightweight, uh, high resolution, and uh, low cost detectors can revolutionize this field. And we can construct large size infrastructures, which can allow uh, real near time imaging of these gigantic objects like volcanoes. So, as an outcome of this cooperation, we had a, we had a joint patent, which, uh, which serve a pillar for future cooperation with industrial partners. In 2017, we joined to, to the integrated program for next generation volcano research and human resource development of the Japanese government, which aims to developing cutting-edge volcano observation technology and contributing to volcano disaster prevention. On the lower left image, you can see a schematic uh, of our experiment. So we installed our detectors approximately three kilometers far from the volcanic edifice services, which is a quiet, safe distance. And we, we are measuring the muons which are penetrating through this, uh, this very active volcano that uh, poses a quiet hazard to the surrounding area, like Kagoshima city with with a population of more than a half million. Just few technical things I would not, would not like to go to into the details. Here are, you can see just the schematic of the experiment. So you can see a photograph of two models. So basically this is a modular system as highlighted in the middle draw. So currently we are running uh, 11 systems which are tracking the muons through the volcanic edifice and uh, we are applying uh, microcomputers to, to collect the data in real time and these are continuously transferred to remote computers where 
monitoring and data analysis can be done. Of course, as our experiment expanded in the meantime from uh, 2017, our colleagues from Hungary could come to Japan twice or three times per year, and we installed together the instrumentation. And I am, as a researcher in the University of Tokyo, I could work on the maintenance of the instrument and also data analysis for scientific purposes. And this uh, joint uh, work between Japanese and Hungary, and this, this could be supported by different uh, uh, grants and programs. One example is a joint usage research project of the University of Tokyo and also the Horizon 2020 could also provide support for, for uh, traveling uh, to the researchers and also in Hungary for the instrumentation development, National Research Development and Innovation Office also provide uh, valuable support. So as, as our system developed, we could get more support and we could, uh, we could uh, uh, intense the, the work. I would like to highlight a few results. So the first one is uh, we could uh, resolve the internal structure of the volcano, as you can see in the upper left image, with an imaging uh, resolution of below 10 meters to achieving such a such a resolution by other techniques like, like gravimetry is quite challenging and requires a large amount of, uh, of instruments. So it seems to be a technological progress which can, uh, which can uh, contribute to volcano observation. Uh, we could monitor the changes in the amount of material on the, on the volcanic edifice itself, so not inside, just on the volcanic edifice which deposited due to the volcanic act, and we observe also the erosion and, uh, and decrease of this uh, amount of material due to mood flows, which also pose hazards to the surrounding area. One example is the, in, in case of Colombia in 1985, when uh, 25,000 people died due to these uh, mood flows. So it's a serious issue. It's not a direct volcanic hazard, but it can pose serious hazard to the surrounding area. Concerning the interior of the volcanic edifice, we observed uh, how the density increased after the eruption stopped from the active Showa crater. So we observed the plugging of this crater, which suggests that it will not erupt. So it, it did not erupt since 2000. Uh, uh, 17. And also, since 2017, we monitored how the density changed during the different eruption episodes, and we could observe inverse correlation between the, the density reconstructed by myography and the frequency of the eruptions occurred from the craters. So it is interesting to note that when, uh, when, uh, when the vulcani, volcano is erupting, it act material, so the density is decreasing, and when it's uh, plugged, so it's dormant, it's the material is accumulating beneath the crater, so the density is increasing. So monitoring continuously a density, for example, it can provide uh, useful complementary information for intermediate term uh, uh, assessment of the volcanic hazard. For example, if we see continuously how the density is increasing, so materials accumulating beneath the, the dormant crater, it suggests that maybe after some time it will erupt. Uh, concerning the short-term prediction of the eruption, so whether we can ask the weather, will the volcano erupt tomorrow? So of course we can uh, study these kind of questions. So today, maybe you heard about uh, the application of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, help to reconstruct uh, hidden features in, in images which are not observed by human eyes. So for example, uh, we, can, uh, we can develop models. You can see an example on the lower left uh, schematic, which can uh, read as an input uh, series of uh, 
myographic images which captured actually day by day, but as we increase the system in the future, it can be hour by hour or, or, uh, or shorter time, but of course we need a larger system. But what is important here, the model can process these images, extract the features, and uh, decide about that whether some eruption will occur on the next day or not. Uh, uh, standard uh, analysis technique like the receiver operating characteristic can be performed on this, uh, on this evaluation. So here are, you can see an example for, uh, for the performance. So vertical range shows the true positive rate, which is related to the sensitivity of the technique for the eruption, which is, shows that almost 75% uh, of the cases, it, uh, it forecasted the eruption. And the horizontal scale shows that the false positive rate, which related to the fake forecasting, so currently it is somewhere above 20 percentages. So this curve should be improved. So as you can see, the dot uh, should uh, be on the upper left corner. So the promising are, let's say, promising, but, uh, but we should uh, improve on it. How, how can we improve? So for example, if we can uh, improve the size of the system and the imaging resolution, we can, uh, we can learn uh, more accurately the features of the images. And also if we combine this technique with other observation data, it can improve the reliability of the technique. Okay, I would like to turn uh, to the next part of this presentation, which is the intersectoral collaborations in Japan. So besides the volcano monitoring, uh, myography can be utilized for different applications. Specifically, it can contribute to four of the sustainable development goals. And here I just focus on the sustainable cities and, uh, and communities. So again, thanks to the support of the Embassy of Hungary and Tokyo, we could initiate uh, collaboration with, uh, with the Japanese giant company called NEC, who licensed our common patent. And we, 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 we initiated works on both development of, of instrumentation and imaging techniques, and also, also we did some case studies. One example is a blind testing of myography on, a, on reinforced the Buryat concrete railway pillars. You can see example in the middle. You can see photographs in, in the left, which is a pillar on the left is buried into a mound. And uh, there is another, uh, there is a tube a few meters far from this uh, Buryat pillar, which inside we installed the detector. And the aim, aim of the measurement was to, to reconstruct localize the, the bottom of the pillar. So for in this case, we could measure the bottom of the pillar at the depth of two meters. So, so this technique may provide useful information in the future if, for example, these pillars are cracked or some problems, structural problems have. So, so experts can decide whether they will replace the, these pillars or, or not. Uh, this uh, work was also patented in Japan by three academic institutes and, and NEC Corporation. And uh, we had another collaboration with the Sabo Frontier Foundation, that is a Japanese uh, company that is focusing on maintenance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, upstream dams in Japan. There are about a few thousand of dams which are responsible for sediment control in this mountainous era. So these are very crucial for the safety of the population around these places. And most of these infrastructures built more than 50 years ago. And uh, they have to, they need tools which can help to decide which, which infrastructure should be re renovated or not. So we also conducted myographic survey of a uh, Sabo Dam in Gunma Prefecture, Japan. And you can see on the lower left the image of the dam. The, the red rectangle highlight the studied uh, region, and on the right you can see the myographic image. And the, the color scale shows the density from low to high density, and the blue 
region highlights a weak ARA inside this dam. So this work demonstrates that uh, maybe this technique can be useful to this, this purposes. So I would like to summarize this talk. So we learned that myography is a non-destructive and passive imaging technique which allows the X-raying of large structures. And, uh, and progress in the technical development and also cooperation between academy and, and in industry can contribute to achieve some of the sustainable development goals, like to provide resilient cities or sustainable resource exploration. And, uh, and in the, you can see a photo about a book cover, which we, we, we edited in during the pandemic. So if you are interested in more details, please read this book. Just a few words about uh, my plans for the future. So I am working in Tokyo almost six years. So my plan is to, to, to return to, to the European Union in Hungary or other country and, uh, and using this experience to, to, to develop the local, co co local communities via earth sciences and the related applications. Thank you very much for your attention. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Martin Baca, a professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering, Tokyo Institute of Technology. He will talk about his research and the presentation title is Nanoscale Properties and the Function of Organic Materials. Dr. Baca, please proceed to the podium and uh, start your presentation when you are ready. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Martin Vacha. I'm from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology. And uh, I would like to talk today mainly about this topic, nanoscale properties and function of uh, organic materials. Before that, let me just mention briefly something about myself, how it happened that I'm, I'm here in Japan. And uh, then I will spend most of the time on, on, the, on the research topic. And in the end, uh, maybe I, I may offer some kind of uh, advice or, or, or note on prospects for careers at uh, Japanese universities. So I received my PhD in Prague in, uh, at Charles University in 1991. I'm originally from Czech Republic. And uh, then I came to uh, Japan as a postdoc at first to Tokyo University, where I spent one and a half years. And then this was followed by two more postdoc uh, positions at, in Tsukuba and again in Tokyo. And at, at that time, somehow, I, I decided I would like to uh, seek an academic career in Japan. So I, I went through two assistant professor positions in Gakushuin University and Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. And finally, I got this, this permanent position at Tokyo Institute of Technology in 2004, first as associate professor and now as, as a full professor. So you probably know that the Tokyo Institute of Technology is a national university. It's uh, quite highly ranked in the international rankings. It's about third, fourth place in Japan after the University of Tokyo and, and Kyoto University. And I'm also currently uh, editing an international journal. So let me mention what we are uh, doing as, as research. It's, it's about uh, organic materials and specifically about organic semiconductors, both small molecules or conjugated polymers. So these are materials that absorb and emit light and uh, carry charges, transport electric charges. So they are potentially used in uh, organic electroluminescence displays, in the solar cells, in, in the flexible solar cells, in the biosensing, bioimaging. And we are interested in, in nanoscale properties of these materials. And we use uh, microscopy, optical microscopy and spectroscopy. So what we do is that we use a fluorescence microscope and look at uh, emission 
fluorescence from individual molecules. So if you look at one molecule at a time, this is a video which shows you how uh, many individual molecules emit light. You see these bright spots, each bright spot corresponds to one molecule. They are all chemically same, identical. But as you can see, each of them is emitting in a different way, in, with different intensity. Uh, they are blinking. And we can do a lot of uh, spectroscopy on these materials. We measure spectra, lifetimes, and so on. So the point here is that uh, if you look at the material on nanoscales, you find many phenomena which are not visible when you look at the material in a bulk. So you have a spatial kind of spatial heterogeneity, kind of a temporal heterogeneity, and you find new phenomena and properties which are otherwise inaccessible. So we use this, this method which is called single molecule or single, single particle spectroscopy on many different topics in, in material science, mainly organic materials. So you look at uh, conjugated polymers, at uh, electroluminescence of, of single molecules. You also look at, at the phenomena in the field of polymer physics. You also study light harvesting complexes or generally photosynthetic systems. And recently also semiconductor quantum dots or perovskites. Perovskites are also a new class of very uh, uh, promising materials. Let me give you just a few examples if I have time of what we do. So as, as I mentioned, we are interested in, in the conformation and photophysics of conjugated polymers, how the shape of conjugated polymer chain decides uh, the way the, the chain emits light. For example, here is a, a, a so-called conjugated polymer, so-called polyfluorine, which is emitting blue light if it is dissolved in, in a solution. But if you make an electroluminescence device and, and, and uh, let the polymer uh, emit by electroluminescence, it emits green light. So there, is, there has been a lot of research on this and when we look at single molecules of this, this uh, polymer chain, we find out that even one chemically, it's, it's a chemically identical molecule, can for a time emit green light and then switch to blue light, then switch to green light and so on. And uh, so our conclusion was, the, is the, was that uh, it is the conformation of the chain which determines what kind of color uh, this uh, polymer chain emits. This was picked up by Nihon uh, Keizai Shinbun as 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 in 2014, because because it's it's kind of world's smallest flashlight if you think of it. You have one one polymer chain which is emitting electroluminescence. And just a few more examples. So this is a photosynthetic system. So photosynthesis is kind of a natural solar cell. So we were looking at, at how uh, photocurrent is generated in one photosynthetic system and how this is enhanced by uh, plasmons of uh, um, gold nanorods, which are close to this system. Uh, we also look at, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, perovskites. Perovskites are really uh, new promising materials in optoelectronics and solar uh, cells. And uh, this is uh, research on nanocrystals of this, this perovskite, where we compare, again, how the perovskite emit in photoluminescence and electroluminescence. You can see that there is quite a difference in these two traces in electroluminescence. There is a lot of blinking, a lot of loss of energy, and we are looking at the reasons for the loss of energy. One more example is from the field of polymer physics. This is um, uh, like an organic molecule which can emit green light when it is in free space or in a solution, but it emits blue light if it is uh, fixed in a rigid matrix. And we can uh, monitor the emission from this one molecule in, doped into a polymer film. 
and we are able to see uh, what is the surrounding of this molecule. We are able to monitor the so-called free volume of the polymer in time and the changes in, of the free volume. And this is, this is one important topic in uh, polymer physics. And the last uh, example is, is uh, monitoring of uh, uh, photopolymerization reactions in, uh, in real time. So this is about uh, my research and the last slide um, kind of uh, personal, personal notes on uh, uh, what would be the possible, this is my, this is my group at Tokyo Institute of Technology <coughs> and uh, um, so it's my experience at, at National Japanese in University and it, it is experience about the regular tenured faculty positions, such as uh, uh, um, associate professor or full professor. So uh, if you are interested in such a position, each, each uh, such regular tenured fa faculty is required to, of course, do research, apply for funding, write reports required to teach undergraduate and graduate courses, supervise uh, uh, students. And it's involved also in a lot of uh, other activities. Not, not many people realize that you, you have to work on entrance exams. You have to prepare entrance exams problems. And uh, there is a lot of administration. So once you get to the level of uh, full professor we are required to do department heads, course heads, and so on, various committees. And the, the um, thing is that most of this is done in Japanese language. So for most of these, uh, these uh, activities, you need to have working level of Japanese so that you would be at, at all considered for the position. I don't have any, any better message, any more positive message. This is how, how it is. Because uh, uh, now at, at uh, my department, we are actually in the process of hiring a new full professor. The best candidate is actually a foreigner. He has twice as many publications as all the other candidates, but he will not get the position. Because if he gets, that's it. Uh, all these these uh, duties will be will have to be done by someone else in the department. So um, I I myself, when I was applying for this position, I probably sent uh, 30 at first 30 applications, all were in English. The first application that I sent in Japanese was the successful one. So um, this is this is in, this is important. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, let me introduce next speaker, Mr. Axel uh, Kropenstein, director of our dedicated partner, German Academic Exchange Service, they are the regional office, Tokyo, and the director at the German Center for Research and Innovation, Tokyo. He will talk about the research in Germany, opportunities and funding. Mr. Kappenstein, please uh, proceed with your presentation when you are ready. I'm very happy um, that this week, uh, in cooperation with EURACCESS, uh, we are able to host the European Research Days here today. We can cooperate here um, to provide some background information and um, to provide some insights um, on the great research projects that are currently uh, taking place at the nexus between Europe and um, Japan. Um, it was very enlightening. I'm, I'm uh, a lay person um, about the, the two topics that were presented um, before, but I enjoyed the presentation very much and I um, thought it was a, a great illustration um, of what, what kind of great research is, is conducted here by European researchers in, uh, in Japan. I'm also very happy um, to join my um, colleagues uh, Mr. Pella Novic um, from the Hungarian Embassy and Ms. Viljanin from uh, um, Finland um, to uh, present some um, 
background information or what kind of research opportunities are available in Europe. And I'll talk a little bit um, about the, um, the general outline of the German research landscape. Um, I have a, uh, a small announcement uh, with regard to a program that the uh, German Academic Exchange Service is conducting, which I think might um, be of interest to, uh, interest to some research. Um, and I also wanted to, to say a brief words, a few brief words on the German Center for Research and Innovation. Um, why? Because I think it's a, it's a, a good address um, for researchers uh, to contact and to, um, to stay in touch with, um, because we, we are trying to, to form a hub where um, researchers working um, in Germany, working in Japan, are coming together and where they can exchange information. Okay. Very brief. Um, now, if you, if you want to um, have detailed information on conducting research in Germany, I um, highly recommend to you to go to the website of this project, Research in Germany. You can simply, uh, simply look it up online. Um, I can also show you the URL later on. You find a wealth of information on the German research landscape, including all the actors, all the institutions, um, that are involved there, as well as uh, ways to obtain research. I, I keep very short, um, but just as a, as a very brief overview, um, some basic facts. Now, okay. Um, what buttons do I have to press here? Now, okay, now it's working. Um, now, German, Germany is at the uh, is, is a leader in uh, research. Um, the uh, Nature Index, which measures research output, um, uh, put Germany in 2021 uh, at um, rank number three as the the, uh, the biggest um, science nation. Um, for the past couple of years, Germany has spent quite a lot of um, funds on. Um, uh, research and development um, for the, the past, um, I think since 2017, so for the past four or five years. Um, Germany has spent more than 3% of GDP on research and development. Um, it, it boasts a, a broad range of different research institutions, ranging from universities to public research institutions um, to the private sector, where most, 70% in fact, most of R&D is being carried out. Um, I also listed here um, Germany is world leading in the number of um, patent applications worldwide. Um, so it, it's a good place to conduct research. As a very brief overview over the education system, and now there are currently more than 400 universities in Germany, um, of which 156 are entitled to confer uh, doctorates. Um, it's peculiar about Germany, we have the, the Fachhochschule, the Universities of Applied Sciences, which do not um, confer doctorates in general. There are some um, arrangements with, in cooperation with universities through which uh, you can obtain them. Um, but these are very important um, focal points for um, university industry cooperation. So this is also important to mention here. There are close to 150,000 um, staff members involved in R&D. Uh, including 115,000 researchers and um, there are about 55,000 international academic staff members including uh, 3,500 professors. And uh, research is thriving in Germany and I think we, we are always um, famous for having quite a large number of doctoral students. Currently the number stands at 43,000 um, candidates enrolled in programs in Germany. There are the four big research organizations, which I briefly present here. There's the Leibniz Organization uh, Association with um, 97 um, institutes. Um, the Leibniz Organization, the Leibniz Association is an umbrella organization. Um, it focuses on a broad spectrum 
of subjects with an emphasis on social, social sciences and humanities, though it also includes research on life sciences, natural and environmental sciences, mathematics and engineering. At the Leibniz Association, um, a fourth of researchers um, working there come from abroad, so it's, it's a very international environment. Next, there's the... Oh, okay, I think having a problem because the uh, language is switched to Japanese and doesn't accept my, uh, the, the keystrokes. Next, there's the Max Planck Gesellschaft, which focuses on basic research. It's internationally renowned. Um, there have been 22 global uh, Nobel laureates uh, in natural sciences since um, 1948. There's a high proportion of international researchers. In this respect, the Max Planck Gesellschaft is the most international of the four research institu institutions that I'm introducing here. There are 86 institutes affiliated with the Max Planck Gesellschaft altogether. The third institution is the Helmholtz Association. It's the largest um, German research institution. It runs important research infrastructures and large-scale research facilities, including accelerator systems, experimentation facilities, research vessel, vessels, the place where I'm from in the north of Germany, for example. Um, the, uh, it uh, has a research vessel, um, the Polarstern, the polar star, which conducts research in Antarctica. Um, and the Helmholtz Association also maintains maintains um, supercomputers to conduct research. There are 18 associated organizations. And last, there's the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, the world's leading organization for applied research. I think it's also very um, renowned in uh, Japan as well. Um, and I think it's uh, in, an important model to study when it comes to um, knowledge and technology transfer. I just received a note, I have to keep short a little bit. Um, who supports scientists? Just very brief. There are three organizations, the Alexander Humboldt, uh, von Humboldt Foundation, the German Academic Exchange Service, and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, the German Research Foundation. Now, the um, Alexander von Humboldt Foundation and um, the German Academic Exchange Service, we both focus on uh, funding individual researchers and researcher uh, and, and, and uh, students, so individuals um, and individual mobility. Um, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation focuses on established uh, professors. We focus more on students and um, early career researchers. The German Forschungsgemeinschaft in exchange focuses on funding um, research projects. Um, I keep short. You can look up these um, details online. Let me briefly jump through the slides here to the end. And as I promised before, you can look up all the information at this address here, researchingermany.org. And under funding, you find information on funding opportunities there as well. Now, um, my, my colleagues at the German Academic Exchange Service um, asked me to provide a note on one program that we're running, which I think um, might be very interesting. It's um, the postdoctoral networking tour in artificial intelligence. It's a program um, that is uh, carried out twice a year. Um, it's um, a one-week networking tour through Germany. Um, if you apply, if you're selected, you um, get the uh, chance to meet uh, with representatives from important research organizations as well as from the private sector. Um, you get a chance to visit and connect with research groups all over Japan. Plus, if you participate in one of these tours, you become part of the AI network community, which is a great way to connect across borders. Um, you can look up um, the website. It's at daad.de slash AI net. Um, and you have the information there on the next tours. Every tour has a particular focus. Um, I think the, the last one was um, focusing on robotics. Um, there are other tours focused on, um, on environmental aspects, for example. 
Um, so if you have an interest in that, please take a look. I probably have about two minutes left, I would say now, so very briefly. Um, the German Center for Research and Innovation, the DW, IH Tokyo. You can see here our colleagues. Um, the DWIH is part of the German Academic Exchange Service. Um, there's in fact a global network of DWIH centers around the world, currently six. Um, two of them in the United States, one in Brazil, one in India, and one in Russia. And if you are interested in any of these three areas, I strongly encourage you to contact us and get in touch. If you're interested in research with Germany or in Germany, if you're interested in current calls that are out there, if you're interested in taking part or um, observing symposia, workshops or online talks, you can find the information at our website here. What the um, German Center for Research and Innovation does is essentially we provide a a place to, um, to, um, to show research and innovation and also a hub for researchers to connect. And in Tokyo, we especially focus, of course, on connecting researchers from Japan and from Germany. Um, so if you're a researcher, do you also want to connect with other research organizations or want to um, obtain more information on conducting research in Japan or research in Germany, please do contact us. We work together with a large number of um, supporters in Japan and in Germany, as well as Japanese partners, um, including the, the main um, German research organizations, as well as uh, several organizations also that are uh, more focused on um, economic promotion and several universities. And, yes, check out our website, dwih-tokyo.de. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter. We also have several um, multi, uh, social media channels up there, which you can subscribe to to obtain the latest information. That's it for me. Um, thank you very much. And I think we have one more talk left then today. Our next speaker is Dr. Julia Lombardi. She is a JSPS postdoctoral fellow and now researching at Tohoku University. She will talk about her research on regenerative solid state cooling, exploiting the elastocaloric effect of natural rubber. Just a reminder for those who are watching a uh, live stream, you can uh, post your questions through Slido. Uh, there is a link uh, in the description box. And some of the speakers from the panel one has to leave, so please leave your questions uh, even now and during the presentations. I will bring them up. Uh, uh, before the panel one ends. Okay, so uh, Dr. Lombardi, if you are ready, please start your presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, good afternoon for everyone here in Japan and good afternoon, uh, good morning to everyone uh, assisting virtually from Europe. Uh, thank you for inviting me for uh, this reopen research days here in Japan. My name is Giulia Lombardi and today I will give a brief talk about my research here about uh, regenerative solid state cooling, exploiting the elastocaloric effect of natural rubber. But first I will start with a brief introduction about uh, my educational background. So I come from a small town in Italy uh, called Ancona. Uh, normally people don't know anything about it unless you have to take a ship to go to the other side of the sea. And then I moved to Bologna to conduct my studies about energy engineering. And it was during my master thesis that I decided to go abroad and I asked about the suggestions from professors uh, about um, concerning my interests, and that is where I ended up in uh, Grenoble uh, conducting research about energy harvesting systems, which basically are uh, systems draining the energy directly from their surroundings. And it was there that I realized that I liked the topic about energy harvesting, but mostly 
it's there that I realized that I like research. And so it's, uh, I started to apply for some PhD programs. And I ended up still in France at the National Institute of the Applied Sciences in Lyon. And in looking at a more wider uh, perspective, I was um, in the European project called Henans, funded by the Maurice Lacoste Curie Actions. And the project was called Piezoelectric Energy Harvesters for Self-Powered Automotive Sensors from Advanced Lead Free Materials to Smart Systems. So it's quite a long name, but I think it's self-explanatory because we were working about the development of small sensors that were uh, draining the powers directly from their environments, which are in particular mechanical vibrations and temperature variations. And it was an amazing opportunity because I had the uh, chance to get in contact with uh, many different European universities and industries. And on my side, I, spent, I had the opportunity to spend a considerable amount of time of my PhD at the Imperial College of London. And well, after, at the end of my PhD, it was time to decide about what to do. And I, had to, I didn't have a precise idea, but I knew that I wanted to go abroad. Um, so I contacted this professor that was working in Japan, and he explained me about different opportunities about researchers in Japan, and he mentioned the JSPS fellowship program. So I applied to it and I flew to Japan at the end of 2021. It was quite difficult actually because of COVID and it, was, uh, it seemed like Japan was never going to open its borders but in the end I managed to come. And so I am uh, now conducting a postdoc at the Tohoku University in this joint laboratory called Elite Max, which is an international joint laboratory between France and Japan, and the Institute of Fluid Science of uh, Tohoku University. So now I will switch on to uh, more in details about my research here in Tohoku University. And so we are conducting some research about funding alternative cooling devices. So why do we need to find alternative cooling devices? Well, because uh, the world's energy demands for refrigeration and air conditioning now accounts for 30% of the global energy consumption. And the most widespread technology uh, used up to now is the vapor compression cycle, which is the technology that involves the pressurization and expansion of a gas to remove and absorb heat uh, from enclosed environments. And the main drawbacks with this technology are, can be mainly summarized into two points. One is the use of the high global warming potential for of uh, vapor compression refrigerants, which are uh, gas that are used into these vapor compression cycles that constitute an additional threat to climate change. And the second one is the relatively low efficiency of such a systems, because in the end, we need a huge amount of energy in order to remove the heat from a closed environment. So the options here are mainly but there are many paths that one can follow in order to improve such a system. And I will summarize uh, the main paths into three. One is to try to make this technology much more efficient than it is right now. The second one is to try to replace the refrigerant gas with uh, something less, uh, that is less dangerous for the environment. And the third one is to completely rechange this technology, to completely rethink it. And this is where uh, heat pumping systems based on caloric effects come into pictures. So these systems are based on a caloric material and they are called caloric because with the uh, application of a certain field they give a thermal response. So uh, they can be summarized, they can be categorized into mainly four categories based on the system, on the field that we apply on them. Uh, they can be magnetocaloric if we apply a magnetic field, electrocaloric if we apply an electric field, barocaloric if we apply a pressure, and elastocaloric if we apply a force. And I think that uh, in order to have an idea about uh, the importance of a topic um, in the research communities, I think it could be interesting to give, have a look at the trends of the number of publications over the year. 
And we see that, of course, the, uh, the, the most developed technologies from a scientific point of view is the magnetocaloric uh, effect due to the discovery in 1997 of the so-called giant magnetocaloric effect. And this uh, paved the way to um, the other technologies involved in these systems, which are the electrocaloric and then barocaloric, and then finally they discover of the elastocaloric effect. Uh, even though the elastocaloric effect was the last one to be exploited by the scientific communities in this particular application, it was actually uh, considered as one of the most promising technologies uh, from the US Department of Energy in order to uh, replace uh, the current vapor compression technology. And in our cases, we are working with particularly natural rubber. So why we're working with natural rubber? Because even though the elastocaloric effect of natural rubber was studied throughout the 19th century, it was only recently that it gained a lot of interest due to its low cost, high abundancy, and of course, uh, environment friendly material. And also, it requires much lower tensile stress compared to the most used uh, material for elastocaloric um, systems. And so, the question is, uh, the, um, the caloric materials actually exhibit time variations of temperature, but we actually need a special gradient of temperature in order to develop a cooling system. And in order to do so, there are mainly two ways that we can follow. One is the single stage devices, and the other one is the active regenerative systems. So the single stage devices mainly consist of putting uh, in contact the caloric material when it exhibits the highest temperature with a hot reservoir, and then put in, in contact with a cold reservoir when it exhibits the cold temperature. So this is quite straightforward, but it doesn't uh, leave space for a scalable system. It's, this is where active regenerative systems are more efficient. So in this case, we apply the external field, so in this case is a tensile force. Then we make the working fluids, in this case the active regenerative systems work thanks to a working fluid that is transporting the heat from one place to another. And then we remove the external field so that the system uh, cools down. And then we make the working fluid move from the hot to the cold reservoir in order to transport the heat. And so this is where we wanted to uh, focus because it's, uh, much, it's a much more, much more scalable uh, system. And so our system works in this way. So we have a system composing of several natural rubber tubes. First, we apply our tensile force so that the system exhibits a hot temperature. Then we make the working fluid move from the cold to the hot reservoir. Then we release the system so that the temperature goes down. And then we make the fluid move from the hot to the cold reservoir. So doing so cyclically, we can see an exhibition of the spatial gradient of temperature uh, after 4,000 seconds. And we have a temperature gradient from the cold to the hot reservoir of about 10 degrees. So then we measure the power by putting a um, resistance at the bottom of the reservoir, and uh, we power the resistance until the temperature on the bottom reservoir reaches uh, room temperature. So the results here are, of course, uh, the optimum results that we obtain from optimum conditions because we tested two different devices, uh, one with 90 tubes, which was actually the first devices that was tested. And then in order to see what was the influence of the geometry in such a system, we decided to decrease the diameter by two of the tubes so that with the same amount of space, we could uh, work with 55 tubes. And we concluded that well, working with two different wave frequencies and also working with different fluid motions inside the systems, we gained higher cooling power and higher uh, COP, which stands for coefficient of performance, which is a very important coefficient when you are working with uh, cooling systems. So we obtain higher values when working at higher frequencies and higher fluid volumes, but lower temperature spans. But also, the dinner diameter, um, we found that it strongly influenced the regeneration factor, which is defined as the ratio between the final temperature span exhibited by the system divided by the temperature that can be exhibited singularly by the material. 
And so the work conducted was, uh, well, there were many people behind the work that I briefly presented today, uh, mainly from Japan, from the Tohoku University, and also we are collaborating with uh, the Institute, uh, the National Institute of Applied Sciences in Lyon, uh, where in Japan, we focus more on the system development, while in France, they are focusing more on the material characterization. And also, we have some partners with the uh, University of Nantes. And so it's thanks to the collaboration of many researchers that we, are, uh, that we have gained these uh, results. So I would like to thank you all for your attention. And if you have any questions, I I'm ready to discuss with you later. Thank you very much. The speaker of the panel one, uh, last speaker of the panel one will be Dr. Anna Maria Villianim, director of Finnish Institute in Japan. She will introduce us to the research funding in Finland. Thank you very much for coming today. And uh, Dr. Villianim, floor is yours. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for asking me here today. This was a really last call, and I have been really interviewing the new researchers in the other room, so, so uh, anyhow, thank you for this. Where do I find my presentation here? So sorry. Anyhow, I will be using the time uh, very effectively. My name is Anna Maria Villanen. I'm the director of the Finnish Institute uh, here in Japan and have been here for the past five years. My background, I'm also a researcher, thank you so much. Uh, that is that I am economist, but I defended my doctoral dissertation in art history uh, at the University of Helsinki some eight years ago, as a matter of fact. So uh, thank you, Axel Kaberstein, for your excellent presentation. I will be showing you some figures uh, to show you also that Finland is the little sister of Germany when it comes to the uh, research funding. And also to the Giulia Lombardi, I also have very, very um, big dreams to, to um, continue with my postdoc, but it's a bit impossible so far here. Anyhow, funding opportunities for research in Finland, I'm trying to be very brief here today, although usually always talking too much. Let me see. Okay. So I will be talking to you very briefly about what is our role, the Finnish Institute's role when it comes to science, also basic information about the Finnish universities, then coming to the digital platforms when it comes to funding, and then I have some useful links for you. So the Finnish Institute in Japan, we are celebrating 25th anniversary next year. We are a non-profit organization funded by the Ministry of Education in Finland. And we have been here for 25 years. And uh, the main task really are to establish and strengthen the ties between Finland and Japan when it comes to science, culture and higher education. So. We are part of the kind of network of cultural and academic institutes of Finland. There are 17 of us. We are the third is one away. Then there's another one in New York, in Beirut, and the rest of those are in Europe. So what we are doing here is that right now we are having independent research projects uh, with the, in collaboration with the Finnish and Japanese universities. And um, then we are also having the kind of roadshow to the Japanese universities where we are introducing what we are doing and helping them to get contact with the Finnish universities and eventually also with the bilateral agreements. Uh, we are here, you can also see what are the focus points when it comes to the research that we are doing or promoting. Here, for instance, AI and women's uh, empowerment. More information you will um, find on our very, very active social media channels, being Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. But what is more is that we are a tiny nation, only 5.5 million people, which means that what we are focusing on is education, education, and education. We are also a very strong democracy, inclusion and non-discrimination, and equality are some of the things that we are really focusing on also when it comes to research. 
But what is what is really the guideline for us and for the whole Finland? This is the vision for 2035, where you can see that it really is all about strengthening the international dimension of Finnish higher education and research. And this is something that we are really truly focusing on. And this is something that you can also see when we are coming further in my presentation. We have 13 universities. Uh, and 22 universities for applied sciences. And if you go for, I will be showing you a link where you can check this out. They are evenly spread around Finland. English thought degree programs you can uh, find on every level. That is some bachelor's and master's and doctoral levels. And the conduct, uh, we are also conducting the free research. Here is one of the sites where you can see uh, and find out more about the study and research opportunities in Finland. So, uh, well, while we are boosting the research, we are also boosting, and I might say also quite good, when it comes to digitalization. So where you are, uh, whether you are funding, uh, applying for a funding as an uh, individual researcher or a research community is very easy to find. One of these portals you can see over here, research.fi. And here you can see that you see with one glimpse only, you have the publications, how many are here registered, also the projects and funding goals. Now, if you're a scholar, you know that it's where can I find the information? So just check into this portal and you will find everything there. And as you can see, it's also in, fin uh, in English, so because we are fully aware of the fact that Finnish is a very difficult language, maybe as, almost as difficult as uh, Japanese, I might say. But whereas uh, when talking about the importance of the research, so I might say that we are quite good yet again. This is a research funding when uh, measured in GDP, whereas my colleague, I might say maybe uh, from Germany, was pointing out, was it 3.2 of the GDP in Germany? Uh, okay, all right. Well, 2.91 for the tiny Finland, so we are quite very... Um, uh, proud of that figure and here you can see also within the European Union, this is 2020, it was 2.19. So this is, you can also see here that our future absolutely lies in research and education. Uh, when it comes to the actual, I'm going right now to the point, research funding. Here are the biggest uh, institutions to apply funding from. Academy of Finland, research funding. Then we have also the Finnish Innovation Fund. We have the Council for Finnish Foundations. Big money lies there. And then we also have EDUFI. Uh, that is a kind of organization that is also giving grants for the master students. For instance, we are having right now at the institute two of the trainees coming via EDUFI here. Uh, but now I'm going to present to you these briefly these biggest um, uh, funding institutions. The first one being here, uh, Academy of Finland. By the way, it's not a school, so it's only it only has one task, and that is to give funding. And just to remind you, we had our Prime Minister Sanna Marin visiting Japan last May. And we had, at the same time, we had the director of the uh, Academy of Finland also visiting uh, Miss Paula Eerola. And this was really also to put the focus even more on research. We have then, uh, when it comes to the um, Academy of Finland, we have, or it is giving, 500 million euros per year and uh, to different kind of uh, research activities and uh, over 5,000 researchers uh, are working on projects supported by the academy. Uh, and by the way, although it's not a school, 
uh, if you are funded by the academy, you are being called the academy professor for one funding term being five years. When it comes to the Academy of Finland still, so uh, the most money is really often given to the universities, something like 398 million. But uh, it's very, very important to know that the foreign organizations are given something like 5% of the funding yearly as well via the Academy of Finland. So it truly is also an important channel for the foreign organizations to apply for funding. The next one is uh, then the uh, CITRA. Uh, which is funding for science and technology. This is a kind of screenshot that I took from their uh, website only this morning, as a matter of fact. Uh, the uh, Finnish Innovation Fund, this is an independent public foundation which operates still directly under the supervision of the Finnish parliament. And uh, its value back in 2017 was as much as 771 million euros. So here again, we are really uh, talking about a very, very um, valuable way of funding. Uh, the objective of this foundation is, I quote, to promote stable and balanced development in Finland, qualitative and quantitative uh, economic growth, and international competitiveness and cooperations by means of supporting projects that increase the efficiency of the economy, improve the level of education or research, or study future development scenarios." End of quote. Then we are coming uh, to the uh, Association of Finnish Foundations. This was the association was really uh, registered in 2004. It has so far 217 members. And these members supported Finnish science, art and civil society with 580 million last year. And if you are thinking about what is the wealth of all these different foundations, inside in the association of the Finnish foundations, it is as much as 13 billion euros. So this is a kind of private from the private sector coming in and very, very uh, well uh, way of funding also the research. This uh, particular association of the Finnish foundations um, is also a member of Philia, that is the Philanthropy Europe Associations, and WINGS, which is the worldwide organization comparable to Philia. Now, when it comes then uh, to the other kind of research funding services, this is from my alma mater, the University of Helsinki. And this is something that you can see. So whatever, whenever you need sharing information on funding opportunities, whatever really, if you are a researcher coming to Finland and you have a family with you and so forth, information about the schools, kindergartens, whatever. So this is really the portal where you can find everything. And also <coughs> when it comes to all the services, whether it's this university or the other universities in Finland, so um, everything you can find also in English. There's always English-speaking people uh, helping you in every way they can. Here I have gathered some uh, useful links. Um, there is first of all the Vision 2035 and all these different kind of slides that I have just shown you. So this is something where you can gather and find more information. And if you need more information, you can most certainly be in contact with us at the Finnish Institute in Japan. By the way, we are located in the same building with the Embassy of Finland, so it's quite easy to find us in Hiro. And now we are, of course, uh, very, how was it someone once described the Finnish people that we are very stubborn, we have the Sisu code. And so I will give you also what is our goal. 
vision and roadmap of the Research and Innovation Council of Finland, in 2030, the most attractive and competent environment for experimentation and innovation. So stay tuned for that and more information. Welcome back to the day two of the European Research Days, Japan 2022. At panel one, we have covered a wide variety of topics, including research, uh, research achievements by European scholars and research opportunities by European institutions. So panel two, we focus on activities of European research organizations based in Japan. We have invited uh, four representatives of European research organizations and they will give you insight into how European researchers in Japan find and at the same time make opportunities for expanding their fields. Now, uh, let me make a brief announcement that the guest speaker, um, Dr. Daniel Del Barrios, uh, Barrio Alvarez, the chairperson of the Association of the Spanish Researchers in Japan cannot make it today due to the sudden illness. Uh, <coughs> I, will, uh, I will say sorry for the change and we will shorten and change the time frame. Okay, now let us begin and, uh, with the first distinguished guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Heinrich Menkhaus, Chairman of German JSPS Alumni Association, JSPS Club, and also Chairman for the German Law Faculty and Graduate School of Law, Meiji University. Uh, Menkhaus Sensei, floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I should uh, swiftly correct uh, what was just said. I'm not the chairman. I'm just a normal professor uh, of law and my personal field is uh, German law and of course the comparison with the Japanese legal system. Do I uh, find my presentation here? So I am uh, representing the German JSPS uh, Alumni Association. JSPS is standing for Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. But uh, membership to our association is not restricted to former scholars or current scholars of uh, JSPS. We are actually the only alumni association of uh, scientists from the so-called German-speaking area of Europe who have experience in Japan. Therefore, all other researchers and even students uh, working and studying in Japan are we welcome as members. As our German name is uh, quite long, we usually cut the name short to JSPS Club. Uh, we were founded as the first JSPS uh, Alumni Association in 1995, and the legal foundation of our association is a non-profitable and even charitable association according to German law. The purpose, of course, promoting scientific exchange between German-speaking countries and Japan. 
uh, look at the board. Uh, you see that uh, we have uh, different responsibilities. Of course, you need a treasurer, but uh, more interesting are, uh, of course, fundraising uh, activities and, uh, of course, also awards. We have our own uh, award. Uh, but we also have a couple of rights to suggest people for awards uh, given in German-Japanese scientific relations. One word about institutional members. So we have not only personal but also institutional members and as you can see from this slide, we have a couple of Japanese universities that uh, happen to have offices in Europe uh, as members. And all this started because many Japanese universities were not um, taking care of their own alumni um, and with our help they uh, try to find uh, their old alumni uh, in the German speaking area and they also of course uh, can find uh, possible uh, teachers for their uh, universities and they can also be a venue for our activities in Japan. This is uh, membership development uh, since the foundation of the uh, association and I am quite happy uh, that we did not lose members uh, during the pandemic. We are still growing, but not as fast as we did before. We have a couple of events in the German-speaking area, namely a scientific uh, symposium that we run together with the Bonn office of JSPS uh, in Germany. Uh, this year we could uh, again meet in Berlin. You see the number of people in front of the uh, German-Japanese uh, center in Berlin after we had to uh, stop the other symposia because of uh, the pandemic. Then we have a yearly event that is solely for members and their uh, spouses and uh, children. And as you can see, uh, we will this year meet in Ilmenau, which is a famous university, but a very small one in the east of uh, Germany. Then together with um, JSPS, Bonn office, we are also running what we call the Junior Forum uh, that is uh, very important as we would like to support uh, the young people, including the students who would like to study in Japan. And uh, one other event, especially for the young people, is this orientation for those who participate in the so-called 
summer program that JSBS is offering uh, for students here in Japan, but it's only a few weeks program. Then, um, let me switch this. We also have events uh, in Japan. Uh, most important are the uh, club meetings. Uh, the next one, as you will see, is on December the 3rd, and it will be in Tokyo. And uh, this year, for the first time, we go together with uh, JAPI, which is an organization founded by the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it is uh, looking after the foreigners who have studied and doing research in Japan. Then every five years, we also have symposia uh, in Japan, the one in 2020. Unfortunately, we had uh, to cancel, but the one in 2025 is already in the planning, and it will be at my alma mater in Tokyo, namely uh, Meiji University. Uh, we are also participating in the so-called orientation that JSPS is giving for the postdoctoral fellows four to seven uh, times a year. You see some pictures here uh, from the last event which took place at the end of 2019. Then, as I already said, uh, we have our own award. Uh, this award goes to one or two persons every year who create their own network of exchange, scientific exchange between the German-speaking area and Japan. Here you see on the right side uh, Professor Inu Ue, who got the award last year. He is a professor in Munich, in Germany, and on the left side, still a young fellow, as you can see. Uh, he is working at a Japanese university as a German right now. Um, let me mention um, some of the publications. So for every uh, birthday, we uh, publish a Festschrift. That's a very German thing. Uh, you remember certain anniversaries in the German-speaking world by publishing what we call a Festschrift, commemorative uh, volume. And then on the right side, you see our newsletter, which uh, has recently switched from the German into the English language. Um, as we uh, have quite some uh, sponsors, uh, we can um, also fund certain activities um, of um, our members. For example, our members can in invite with our funds Japanese colleagues for symposia and workshops in the German-speaking area. And um, we can also fund other projects that are closely related to scientific exchange. Well, that's uh, already my presentation. Of course, I'm willing to answer all questions that you might have. Thank you very much. 
Dr. Sara Cosentino, the president of Association of Italian Researchers in Japan, AIRJ, and at the same time, associate professor at Global Center for Science and Engineering, Waseda University. Please proceed to the podium and start your presentation when you are ready. Just in reminder that you can post your questions at the Slido. You can uh, for those who are watching through the live channel, and uh, there is a link in the description of box. Please uh, leave your questions, and uh, we will bring them up during the Q and A session. Okay. 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 Thank you very much <laughs> for your kind introduction. So, as said, I'm Sara Cosentino. I am associate professor at Vazeda University. I, in mechanical engineering, I do robotics. I've been in Japan for 16 years. And so, after some time, uh, the idea of funding the research, um, the researchers' associations, association came uh, to me with my colleagues. Our association um, is very, very young <laughs> compared to the German association. <laughs> there is no comparison. So we are actually still learning how to um, run an association, to be honest. Um, this is a little history of our association. Um, in 2015, we just funded a Facebook group because um, the number of researchers in Japan were growing. I was also a researcher uh, in my last period of PhD. And so I realized that it was nice to have uh, fellow researchers to uh, share experience, uh, both like career experience or uh, suggestions, uh, anything, and also just to uh, hang out together. And so um, at least we funded uh, the Facebook group to, to stay in contact. But um, <clears throat> after a while, the idea came, also seeing the other associations, um, that it would be useful to have um, a formal association for researchers because um, it is um, a good way to interact with uh, um, institutions and to have a little voice um, with um, powerful other agents. So in 2017, um, we made the first proposal of funding the association at the annual meeting of the scientific researchers at the Italian embassy in Tokyo. And uh, it is an interesting thing to say, even though, <laughs> because um, the idea of this association came from talking with the other researchers. So we are a completely democratic association. And um, we tried, or we are still trying, to be honest, uh, to uh, catch the needs of all the researchers, Italian researchers in Japan, and uh, also other researchers. Um, Italian researchers that would be interested in coming to Japan, or Japanese researchers who want to um, do research in Italy, and something like this. So, um, before funding the actual association, we made an official survey uh, with the other uh, researchers to ask, uh, for example, what would be a good name for the uh, association and um, what they wanted this association to be because it seems trivial, but for example, um, the German association started as JSPS Alumni Association. So, um, at the very first members were only JSPS alumni, right? And then, and then it enlarged. But uh, we started the other way around, and um, it is also uh, a matter of 
knowing. Do we want something um, just for Italian people? Is it useful? Uh, or do we want something for uh, people who are interested in researching in Japan and Japanese people who are researching with Italian in Italian institutions? So um, the idea of a, an association should be also of outreaching, especially in research. So, um, and this, this was our idea, but you know, like, uh, as we are a little demo democratic, so we wanted to know whether the other uh, members also, the other would-be members uh, were thinking about. And the, the, the final discussion was that uh, mostly, um, of course, would be for Italian members, but um, also for people who are interested in um, um, strengthening the research um, links between Italy and Japan. So also Japanese members, for example, would be welcome to our association. And um, so in 2019, eventually, the ARJ name is selected. And in 2019, we officially registered the association in Milan. It is important to know that our association is actually formally registered in Italy, not in Japan. So we are waiting for uh, official recognition also in Japan. But at the, in the moment, we are registered in Italy. And this is useful also because uh, we do uh, interact with Italian institutions mostly. So it is important to have a site in our country. And we will see also later on about the GSPS um, Alumni Association. And in 2019 as well, we published the official website that I will present in uh, a few moments. And we presented the association to Vice President of the Italian Chamber of Deputies. So finally, in 2019, December, we inaugurated the beginning of the association. And then in 2020, Corona started and we never met anymore again. So. This was the biggest history of the association. I wanted to spend one second on talking about our logo. This is the logo, the official logo of the Italian association. And it comes between in like uh, um, the meeting of Italian, of course, Vitruvian men, from Leonardo da Vinci, and the Japanese Anko which is a very traditional thing. So uh, in the logo, we wanted really to celebrate um, the coming together of the Italian culture and the uh, Japanese culture. So we chose two very important symbols of both cultures. Um, as I said before, what we wanted was to unite the Italian researchers under a single representative institution. And the main challenge we had, and we still have, is to catch the needs of the researchers and to reach also the researchers that are in Japan or that are interested in Japan or in Italy, the other way around, and understand their needs. So uh, what we are doing at the moment, um, we have like three types of uh, activities. Uh, of course, like a physical <laughs> pragmatic support, uh, funding application support, uh, support on not really doing pensions and tax, but at least explaining how do pensions and tax and more or less um, the labor laws work in Japan. Um, providing um, information about opportunities to come to Japan or to return to Italy and Europe um, to researchers and interact to the embassy with the embassy and also with other institutions for the, in like as a voice for the researchers. Also, we organize cultural events uh, between scientific talks and also culture talks. And uh, of course, we are aiming in building a community of researchers. So we organize when possible indoor and outdoor events, um, activities in Japan. It has to be said um, that um, historically, uh, our association was born by um, 
STEM researchers, scientific researchers, and this because in Italy, the, the Italian researchers in Japan are divided, let's say, under two representative institutions. So um, we have a scientific attaché in the embassy, and we have um, a cultural institute, which still belongs to the embassy, but um, it's in a different place, and they have different uh, organization organizative rules. So the point is um, the humanities researchers and the scientific researchers do not have a lot of uh, way, a lot of uh, um, moments to interact. And our association is mostly um, formed by uh, scientific uh, researchers just because we know each other. So our point now is trying to also extend uh, the association also to humanistic researchers. So um, this is why we're trying at least to um, organize events that are centered on culture and art talk to try to attract also more humanities researchers. It is interesting to see uh, what kind of researchers Italian researchers do we have in Japan? Um, the age is very varied. We have a broad age group. So we have uh, a lot of young researchers that mostly come with scholarships, uh, short-term scholarship. For example, Max scholarship or JSPS scholarships. But we also have um, a few uh, well-established researchers that are in their seniority years. And uh, this presents an interesting situation because, of course, the needs of those the two um, demographic um, groups are different, but they can interact nicely with each other. Uh, most of the, the researchers are resident in Japan while they are researching in Japan, so they are actually under Italian law uh, resident in Japan, so uh, most of them uh, would be interested in information about the Japanese life, for example, not really the Italian life. But some of them also are interested to know how uh, living in Japan for a while will affect the, the returning to Italy, for example. Genders, <laughs> we have mostly males. Uh, of course, we are talking about, as I said, as a little bit biased because most of those research, the polling is in... Um, scientific researchers, but males are more represented. And also this because, uh, unfortunately, academically speaking, males are more represented as a whole mm, in the research uh, environment. And are they Japanese speakers? Uh, about 20% of them, they do not speak any Japanese. Um, another 10, 15%, they're really fully fluent. So there is a variety of skills. And this also is interesting because depending on your Japanese abilities, your ability of navigating the daily life might be different. And also your interest in might be different. Um, an interesting thing is that, um, of course, 70% uh, of respondents are in the greater Tokyo area, but we have a 30% of people um, who are outside Tokyo, so it is important to be able to reach them. And the, um, the positions are very varied, so there is a wide distribution between um, type of positions and also uh, fields and expertise. And as funding, most of the Japanese residents have Japanese funding. This is also why uh, many researchers actually come to Japan because there is more funding possibility than in Italy. And so having those information, these information in mind, we try to um, organize a variety of activities. Uh, for example, uh, last year we organized um, a seminar, a webinar on funding application, how to apply to a Kakenhi. Um, a webinar on about how to um, work, what are uh, the situation between pension and taxes 
uh, also for people who want to stay here for a long time or for people who are thinking anyway they will go back to Europe at some point. Um, what are the opportunities and the links how to go back and forth between Italy and Japan? And the, the interaction with embassy and other uh, groups. And as said, also we organize a lot of cultural events and unfortunately uh, we could not organize a lot of community events, a lot of uh, in-person meetings in those two years and um, we lost a few members in time, the, of course during Corona because uh, some of them went back anyway to Europe and uh, uh, we lost momentum because, of course, we didn't meet. Uh, and so we hope from now on that we can finally can uh, possibly meet um, in person again to um, enlarge and the, the scope of our activities and also our membership. Um, it is important to know that our main uh, current uh, outreach activities are the coordination with the other associations of researchers, for example, the German researchers, the uh, French researchers, and also outside Europe, um, ANZOR, the New Zealand researchers, Euraxis, of course, which is still European. And we have contacts with iRicerca, which is the association of the Italian researchers in the world. Um, we have contacts with uh, the Italian attaché in Brussels for uh, the formal recognition of um, the association. The association is formally recognized, but uh, not yet listed, for example, in the um, researchers associations in the world uh, on our government uh, websites, because we should be at least five years old to be recognized, so we are in the works to be recognized, but we still need uh, some time. And uh, the most uh, important um, activity that we are currently uh, trying, working on, is to um, coordinate the JSPS to fund, to fund the um, JSPS Alumni Association, which we do not have in Italy. And this is also to be able to enable the GSPS Bridge uh, scholarships. As Professor <laughs> Heinrich already has mentioned, they, they actually start the other way around. Um, with the JSPS, the J, let's say the JSPS um, has a very similar, we um, share the same objective of strengthening research activities, of course the JSPS is Japan with many other countries and we are specially focused uh, in Italy. But the idea is to um, try to find, establish a JSPS uh, Italian Alumni Association uh, to be able to um, strengthen more the um, research links between Japan and Italy. Also because all the JSPS alumni, of course, have been in Japan, have been in Japan uh, maybe two years or even more, depending. So now they went back somewhere in the world, not necessarily in Italy, but um, to have them as members and to have them as active members, uh, senior members of our association and also um, the JSPS Alumni Association would be a very good way to um, strengthen the global uh, research um, exchange. And this is basically the end of my presentation. I present our website. Um, there are, if you want to register, there's a way to register. There is how like you can check on the news, the post of all our activities, and also there is a members only space that you can only access if you're a member, and then you will have a few more information on how to live in Japan and some more uh, critical information that might be useful for people who are members. An important thing, and I conclude with this, uh, our very first in-person symposium will be on the 11th of November. It will be hybrid, so it will be either in person and online. And so if you want to attend, please check on the website and uh, register. Thank you very much. Now, let me introduce our next speaker. 
uh, Dr. Aurelien Carver, a uh, board member of Science Scope, the French Students and Researchers Organization in Japan, also a specially appointed assistant professor at Juntendo University Graduate School of Medicine. Please proceed with your presentation when you are ready. Thank you for your introduction. Um, so yes, my name is uh, Aurélien Carrever. Um, I speak here on behalf of ScienceCorp, uh, of which I'm a board member, and I'm also a um, specially appointed assistant professor at Gintendo University, where my research focuses on uh, the role of extracellular matrix in the developing adult and aging brain. <coughs> But today I'm here to speak uh, on uh, ScienceScope activities, so um, let's ask the first question, what is ScienceScope? Uh, ScienceScope is a non-profit organization created in 1993. It's uh, created under French law, so very much like the German and Italian association, we have no legal status in Japan. The mission of ScienceScope is to promote the relationship among researchers and student community and more specifically, the, the French-speaking um, community. And this means that we are not uh, only French people, that we include all citizenship, and we also cover all topics and at all levels. That means that uh, we welcome students that would come to Japan for, let's say, a, a master's or a PhD, um, as well as uh, postdoctoral or more senior professors. And so, to fulfill this mission, we organi organize uh, a series of events um, that I will describe in a moment. And we also try to provide information um, helpful for the community, such as um, job availabilities, grants, internship, uh, PhD position, and so on. So now, who is ScienceCorp? Um, <coughs> before going further, I have to acknowledge that for the past seven or eight years, the, the face of ScienceScope uh, was uh, Thomas Silverstone's face, and it's uh, very recognizable features. Uh, unfortunately, it is with great sadness that we have to announce the passing of our friend and colleague Thomas Silverstone, uh, that was our, our president. Many of you knew him and could appreciate the time, energy, and dedication Thomas devoted to developing ScienceScope activities, such as building bridges between our scientific community and the general public, as well as between our various associations. Um, I want to announce that a ceremony will take place uh, on Friday, that is tomorrow, and that uh, this ceremony will be retransmitted in Japan, I mean, will be retransmitted on Zoom for those who wish to uh, attend. Now, um, moving on, who is ScienceCope? It's, it's members. Um, we have an elected board of five to seven people usually, and also active members that uh, help uh, organize the various events. Obviously, Science Cups um, is also all the attendees that come to our events. But more broadly, it's also a community of uh, around 600 people that um, are within the mailing list and follow the news that we publish um, on our website or on the mailing list or on our social networks. Finally, uh, we couldn't work without our many partners. And uh, as shown here, so it includes um, diplomatic institution from the French side, research institution from the West, uh, French side, as well as some uh, biotech partners and um, partners uh, from the European diplomatic with Araxes and of course uh, the other European associations. And uh, finally, some uh, Japanese universities uh, that uh, very often host some of our events. Now, uh, about where is ScienceScope? So um, here is just to show that the, the board of ScienceScope is uh, always split uh, between Tokyo and the Kansai area. Right now, there's only one person in uh, the Kansai area, but this is probably going to change very soon um, this weekend, we're going to have our uh, general assembly and vote on the, on the new board 
and probably have a more balanced between Kanto and Kansai. I want to mention as well that um, as for the attendees that comes to uh, our meetings, uh, we have uh, people uh, coming from all over Japan, from Okinawa to uh, Hokkaido and, and many different provinces. Regarding ScienceCorp funding, um, we are mainly supported by uh, the French Embassy and its scientific or cultural services. Um, and so they support us financially and help us organize our events. Uh, we also have a very close rela um, relationship with the uh, Maison Franco-Japonaise and uh, they mainly support us by allowing us to organize our event in uh, their place and so we can use their auditorium and seminar rooms. We also have the help of, as I said before, some universities. I mentioned in particular here the Kyoto Seika University. Um, that uh, now host uh, the event that we organize yearly in the Kansai area. So we also have uh, sometimes sponsorship. Membership for our association is only a symbolic southern yen um, and plays almost no role in, in our functioning. Now on our research events, um, the Common features that all our events uh, can share is that they are open to everyone. That means not only the scientific community, but also the general public. They're always free and always French speaking. Although we can sometimes make some adjustment if necessary, but as a rule, we organize French speaking events. To be more precise, uh, we organize two main uh, yearly events. One in Tokyo. Um, last year was the 25th edition of the French Research Day. And for the past seven years, we've also organized a re research event in uh, the Kansai area. We also organized a Café de la Recherche of Coffee Science. Um, those are like singular events uh, based on opportunities. And uh, we also co-organized uh, other events with other um, organisms such as uh, today, for example, where we are very happy to collaborate with Araxis and uh, some other events that I will describe later for uh, the Japanese. A word so for the main event uh, that we organize every year in Tokyo. Uh, it's called the, the French Research Day, Journée Francophone de la Recherche. Um, last year, we only had 90 attendees, but um, this is mostly due to the COVID situation. For the past two years, we could only have an online event, and so the number of attendees uh, dropped quite significantly compared to the previous years. But uh, for example, in 2019, we had more than 200 uh, attendees on site. However, uh, since it was online, uh, we could also retransmit our events in the French high school in Tokyo. Um, so we've been getting um, incorporating um, with the, the French high school more closely uh, these past few years. So they, they've attended the, the event since 2017. And uh, for the past two years, as I said, we, we retransmitted um, the event uh, in, the, in the auditorium of the high school and so more than 150 students uh, could actually attend the event with uh, their professors. And for the past three years, we also had um, students actually proposing contribution and presenting uh, their results at the event. And uh, <coughs> we are very happy to promote uh, this kind of uh, cooperation since we both try to uh, help the scientific community and the relationship between the scientific community and the general public. This group of students is very much at the interface when we can help them take their first step in the research community. It's, uh, I think, a very rewarding um, thing for us. And um, in the table below, I, I showed so this is a number of um, presentations that we had for the past uh, five years. And uh, you can see a sharp drop uh, in 2020 and 2021 because of the COVID. But um, we hope that <laughs> next year events uh, will 
be able to be on we, it will be able to be on site and so we hope that we will recover uh, a, a much uh, a much better ratio um, last year's event also finished on uh, instead of the usual uh, round table that we had we um, took the opportunity um, to present um, very briefly the the research of many professors by um, uh, showing so this the French embassy organized a, a photo concours of the um, science hidden beauty it was called and so um, many of the finalists uh, could actually present their uh, picture and the context of their research in a very very short format of one or two minutes and uh, it was a very interesting and refreshing way to hear about research um, as I mentioned, so the next uh, edition of this event um, so will happen later than usual. Uh, it will be most likely in late uh, January or early February of 2023. We hope to go back over 110 days and uh, we will follow the usual program that we used to do before the COVID. The second main event uh, that we organize now uh, in uh, Kansai, it's called the uh, Rencontre des chercheurs francophones du Kansai, is a quite smaller event in scale, but uh, is kind of like picking up steam over the last few years. This is uh, the event that happened earlier this year in June, and uh, it was the first event that we could finally organize in, on site for the past uh, almost two years and we had about 50 attendees and was uh, organized at Kyoto Seika Daigaku uh, with uh, which we just signed an agreement and probably will be hosting many further events. We also tried to organize uh, more um, singular events such as the Café de la Recherche. Um, last year, for example, we had uh, conference by Cécile Hassan Mabris uh, following the publishing of a book on the post-Fukushima and the sociology of a disaster. Very soon we have the next uh, such event that will happen in, uh, on December 9th and so it will be organized at the French Institute and uh, David Benham will uh, present uh, his work so on the end of life, ethical dilemmas, historical and philosophical insight. So if you are interested to attend, you have the information. Um, a quick word also on some um, other events that we've organized in the past few years. I mean, we didn't organize ourselves, but um, cooperated and tried to provide some support. Um, it's a, a series of events on Japonism, for those of you who would be unfamiliar with it, uh, Japonism is a French term that refers to the popularity and influence of Japanese art and design among a number of Western European artists in the 19th century. And uh, the next events for this will be uh, in late January. I don't think the date has been set yet. It's at the Maison Franco-Japonaise. And uh, it will be... Um, a symposium following the publishing of this book by Jean uh, Sébastien Cluzel about architecture Japanese. ScienceCope also tries to uh, <coughs> um, support uh, other research networks, uh, such as this one, Japarchi, is a research network on Japanese architecture. And uh, I'm just here uh, letting you know that uh, they already submitted a call for application for next year. This is a, a doctoral seminar that is open to the public. And next year, Tema will be on architectural photography. So for anybody who's interested, you can find more information on their website, on japarchi.fr. And there will be four sessions, uh, as described here in February, April, May, and June. Finally, about um, science got next challenges. Um, we still very much consider 
uh, to develop our activities by uh, cooperating with other European uh, associations and eventually try to organize some common events, uh, aside from obviously uh, such, uh, the ones such as today. Um, I also mentioned gender equality. It also appeared in the Italian slide, and I think it's a question that everybody asks. We always uh, try to make our events uh, at parity of gender, be it for the chairperson or for the presentation. Unfortunately, very often we receive much more contribution from uh, men than women, but we encourage uh, everybody to submit uh, their contribution to our meetings. And uh, finally, we also try to develop, when possible, the, the French-speaking community and uh, provide support to other associations, such as the Association of African in Tokyo and uh, other eventual French-speaking countries that would like to develop their activities in Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Caravet, for a very informative presentation. And I also would like to extend my sincere sympathy for the loss of Mr. Thomas Silverton. And, uh, but also, uh, Dr. Kerebe introduced us with many future activities of the organization building on his accomplishment, I believe. Now, we had uh, covered all the presentations at panel one and panel two, and would like to go on to the Q&A session. So let me check if there are any questions from online. And I also would like to uh, welcome questions and comments from the floor, if you may have. OK, uh, I see several questions uh, from online. OK, for the speakers from the panel two, uh, Professor Menkhaus, Professor Cosentino, and Professor Kereve, uh, you said there are several events for your members. Do you welcome non-speakers of their language? And there is also uh, other questions related to it. Are there any membership fees for organization? What are the prerequisites for membership in your organization? So uh, maybe uh, Professor Menkhaz can start to answer the questions. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the questions. Well, no, welcome. Do you welcome non-speaker, uh, non-speakers of your language? Yeah, uh, as I shortly mentioned in my presentation, we switched the language of our newsletter recently from German into English. The reason uh, is quite clear. The number of Japanese colleagues who join our association is increasing. And uh, of course, uh, it cannot be expected that our uh, Japanese colleagues are fluent uh, in the German language. And therefore, we try to adjust by doing almost everything in English these days. Um, as I said, only the members invite members event that is always done in autumn is restricted to the members, their spouses, and the families of the members. All other events are open to everybody who is interested in the topic. And that is uh, even a legal requirement because we are recognized as a charitable association, which means that we don't to have to pay taxes. And uh, this is checked by the tax authorities on a regular basis. And we always have to prove 
that we do not only care for members, but to the public. Otherwise, you lose this uh, charitable uh, position. Uh, as to membership fees, yes, um, we charge uh, 60 euro on a year's basis uh, to members and even 200 euros for institutional members uh, that I showed on one slide. Uh, with this money and the money of sponsors, we can finance our activities. Um, let me mention that, uh, for example, the German Academic Exchange Service um, is a sponsor of our organization financially because they have a fund uh, for alumni activities of former German students who got a, a scholarship from the DAAD. And th there are many among us who are former DAAD uh, fellows. And um, just uh, the name of another sponsor, we have this uh, Jaka Prize, as we call it, that goes to scientists who do the same thing as we, namely building networks between Japanese scientists and scientists from the German-speaking area. And this Jaka Prize uh, comes with a return flight uh, from the respective country, so if the price goes to a Japanese, he uh, might visit the German-speaking area. And this um, is offered by um, a Japanese carrier by the name of, of Anna. I think you are uh, familiar with that. And the club itself uh, offers the money for a two-week stay in a hotel, for example. Was there a third question? Uh, you uh, kind of answered, but uh, the third question was, what are the prerequisites for the membership in your organization? Yeah, the, there are um, actually there's only one uh, condition. Um, you should be interested in the exchange of students, researchers, uh, professors between uh, the German-speaking world and Japan. So everybody is welcome to become a member. It's not restricted to JSPS. Uh, scholarship holders, it only started as an organization for JSPS fellows. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Menkhaus. And Professor Cosentino, do, can you answer to the questions? Yes. So, um, um, I cannot say many different different things from Professor Menkhaus. Uh, our association uh, is, let's say, international, so even the name is in English, so Association of Italian Researchers in Japan. So most of our meetings are open to people who cannot speak uh, Italian, too. Um, of course, uh, outdoor activity or indoor activities like networking might be done in the preferred uh, personal language. But for example, our symposium that will be uh, in, uh, on the 11th of November will be all in English. 
uh, posters will be in English, uh, the keynotes will be in English. Our AJ, RJ talks that are webinars um, are always in English. So, of course, people who cannot speak uh, Italian uh, are welcome to participate. Um, about the membership uh, fee we charge, depending on the seniority, uh, 2,000 yen uh, for younger researchers, which are basically up to the postdoctoral level. Uh, maybe also early assistant professor, depending. No, no, my secretary says no. So until the postdoctoral level. And um, 5,000 yen for, uh, from assistant professor uh, up. Mm, the membership is usually in yen because uh, most, if not all, our members are at the moment residing in Japan. Uh, it, it is equivalent um, in, in euros. Uh, it, it's interesting to note that we have a yearly membership, so it's, uh, it's, it's following the, um, the solar year, but we have, let's say, a grace period, which lasts until the end of May, um, because, uh, because in Japan, the budget's um, allowance starts in April, and so the people who can use uh, their research funding for um, the membership can use their personal funding um, up from April until May. So technically, um, one year membership is about one year and a half, technically speaking. And so uh, it's, it's a good catch. Please uh, get, become a member. <laughs> and <laughs> the last question was, was that for the membership? Prerequisites for becoming members. Um, uh, you should be either a Japanese who is interested in conducting research in Italy or the other way around, an Italian who is interested in res conducting research in Japan or who has already links of research uh, between Italy and Japan. It's like we have not very strict requirements at the moment, let's say, but um, your objective should be strengthening the research links between Italy and Japan, mostly. This is. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cosentino, and uh, Dr. Kerebel. Mm, yeah, thank you. So uh, about the language, as I mentioned, uh, our events are in French, so it's obviously easier to follow if you do speak French. But I have to say that um, in some cases, we also allow speakers to present in English. In the cases, for example, where a, a Japanese student came back from France and doesn't have a, a level of French that allow the student to present in French, we, we allow uh, the, the person to present in English. Uh, or sometimes when the, the subject matter is about France. If the presentation is relevant to the French community, even if the Japanese person doesn't speak French, we may allow the person to, to present his research. Um, but in mostly French, so if, if you don't speak French, it's just going to be not so interesting, I would say. Um, the second question about the membership. Uh, so, we only require uh, 1,000 yen, but this is only really, as I said, just a symbolic. So, you can basically join the uh, wider community of SciencePop and join the mailing list just by contacting us if you're interested in the information that we would provide. Uh, we don't require anything from you. Um, if you want to be a member, the benefit would just be to vote uh, during the General Assembly of the Association for the uh, next uh, board. But um, we don't really live on the money from the membership, so it's uh, not so much of interest for us. So I have nothing really much to say about the requirements. Usually people who are involved in the Association are either uh, French living in Japan, French speaking living in Japan, or they've been living in Japan before and interested in still the cooperation between the two countries on the scientific level. But um, yeah, that's all I could say. 
Thank you very much. So uh, we have another question from online. Uh, this is for uh, Dr. Lombardi and Dr. Ola and uh, Dr. Baha if uh, he didn't leave. So the question is, what has been the most decisive point in your career so far, and how did Japan contribute to your advancement? Okay, uh, Dr. Ola? Yes, thank you very much for your question. So my impression is that uh, the work culture in Japan, so especially the cooperation between the industry and the academy, it provided to me unique experience. So it, it could improve my knowledge, experience, and so on. So this is something that in the future I can bring back to the European Union or Hungary and I can may develop the local communities. So I find this the most important that can bring to home in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ola. And uh, Dr. Lombardi isn't here, she left. Okay. Uh, uh, all right, okay, all right. And um, Dr. Vaha is here? No, no, she, he left. Okay, then, Ah, yes. <laughs> yeah, there is a question for you. The question is, what has been the most decisive point in your career so far, and how did Japan contribute to your advancement? Uh, the most decisive point in my career? That's the question. Um, well, I'm not sure, actually, because it was very, it's very brief, my career, so... I don't have um, very big accomplishments. Maybe the, um, the, the one who gave me the most satisfaction was the uh, Maritza Zlakowska Curie Scholarship during PhD, because it gave me the opportunity to travel a lot around Europe and to be in contact with many researchers. And the second question? How does Japan contribute to your advancement? or? your career? Um, well, the, I think the JSPS scholarship or fellowship is a uh, uh, quite big accomplishment, um, not only because it give you, gives you the funds to conduct research in Japan, but also because it gives, makes you in contact with other researchers in Japan and, well, with uh, <coughs> other professors and well, well, in general, with the research community, both in Japan and outside Japan. So I think, yes, the, I ho hope I answered the question. I think so. I okay. think you did. Thank okay. you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there is one question left for the uh, speakers for panel two. This is a very quick question. How about members uh, who do not work in research anymore? Do you keep them in your research organizations? Maybe you can say yes or no. Uh, Dr. Professor Menkhaus? Oh, you, oh sorry. Uh, we do keep them, but uh, we've noticed that they by themselves kind of like fade out. <laughs> Usually, <laughs> if they don't have any more interest in academics, just by their busy schedule, they, they, they don't get involved so much, but we don't actively push them out. Thank you. Dr. Menghaus? And the same with us. We would never actively push somebody out. Um, most of uh, the members who switch uh, from uh, science to, let's say, industry or to other workplaces, they stay in the organization because during uh, the time of their membership as scientists, they usually got a number of friends in the organization. And uh, our symposia and member invite members events um, become more and more, let's say, familiar. So it is not only science that attracts people to attend, 
It is also uh, the social gathering possibility that is attached to the uh, get-togethers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Costantino. And for us, it's the same. But we are actually a very young organization, so we don't have, we never had this problem yet. But the idea is, yeah, um, the also young researchers that switch from the academic to the industry, or also researchers who are, always have been in the industry, we don't kick them away. If they want to join the organization, they still do some kind of uh, research. Uh, we, jo we, we welcome them. So it's usually a, a personal matter, like if, if they are interested, they stay, or they, if they are not interested, they fade away, as, as Aurelian said, so yes. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, it looks like we've covered all the questions. If there is, oh, yes, please. First of all, thank you so much, everyone. It was really interesting to hear all of your stories, um, how you came to Japan, how you're involved here in so many different organizations and research. I was interested to hear a bit more about your experience as young researchers in Japan when you started out here. What were some of the biggest challenges that you faced, especially as a foreign researcher here in Japan? It's for everyone, but uh, maybe it goes to Julia. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for your question. Um, I think the most difficult part was the Japanese language uh, because everything you're facing is in, well, bureaucratic, from a bureaucratic point of view, everything is in Japanese. And unless you don't have somebody who speaks Japanese for you, you don't speak Japanese, can be quite difficult. But everything else goes very smoothly because it's, it, in the end, it's very efficient. So um, I, that, that was the question, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Anyone else want to answer to the question? Well, I'm not a young researcher anymore, but I've been a younger researcher earlier. Uh, yes, biggest problem was, of course, the Japanese language. And also maybe a kind of a culture clash, say, uh, being Italian, we are Italian, um, we are very social, we, we are very loud, uh, we are kind of picturesque, and then Japanese people are completely the opposite, I think. Uh, and so this was kind of difficult at the very beginning. Uh, but it, it was a difficult thing, but it was also very interesting, the, one of the most interesting aspects of the culture. Right? So, um, because the culture um, has many concepts uh, behind. So it, it was one of the most, as, as the other research that he said earlier from the Hungarian research, it's the, the, the unique experience right, that Japan provides, that it's, it's challenging, but it is a very interesting. I think that it's the, the most important thing that you can get here. So. Thank you. And Dr. Ola? Yeah, just, I would like to add one comment to these uh, language issues. I am also suffering from the same for many years. But I would like to mention that, for example, in the Earthquake Research Institute of the University of Tokyo, there is an international office which aims to provide uh, uh, support to the foreign researchers throughout their stay in Japan. So it's a very, very useful uh, organization, and we are very grateful to them. And I hope it will be spread in Japan, and many of the foreign researchers will get the same support. So thank you, this is just my comment. Thank you very much. Maybe the answer was not specific to Japan, but all the researchers who go across the world might face with those um, challenges. And also, there will be support both in Japan and in Europe as well. Well, thank you very much for the lively Q&A session, and I'd like to close the event. And 
I would like to thank all the presenters today for the fascinating pre uh, presentations. And uh, also, I'd like to thank everyone from the uh, Tokyo for supporting the event behind the screens. I hope you have got some takeaways from today's event. If you have any questions on today's content or Euraccess Japan in general, please contact us at japan at euraccess.net. Also, the recording of today's event will be uploaded on our YouTube channel uh, when it's ready. And we will continue the event tomorrow with exciting workshop for science communication and roundtable gathering science entrepreneurs to talk about career mobility between acad academia and industry. Please uh, watch the live stream channel on YouTube. For more information, please check out our portal and also follow us on SNS, such as Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Line. Once again, thank you very much for joining us today, and we are looking forward to seeing you tomorrow or at our future events. Have a good rest of the day. Bye-bye.